All right, good evening, happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. All right, good night, good morning, good evening, wherever you're watching this video. Welcome to uh, this evening's uh, presentation. This evening we'll be continuing with our reform lines and um, we'll be continuing with our puzzle as we've been going over in the first uh, two videos, putting in the puzzle pieces, putting in the uh, first one with 1798, showing its parallel and its lessons. Also, uh, the second way, Mark, 1833, showing its parallels and its lessons. And by God's grace, we'll go over now to the third way, Mark, which is August 11th, 1840. All right. So uh, without any further ado, let us invite God's presence with us as we kneel and pray. Merciful Father, once again, we come to you asking uh, for guidance, asking you, Lord, that you will lead us and guide us into all truth. I pray that you will hide, hide me behind the cross, Lord, as I go uh, over these um, solemn truths that you have given us, Lord, truths that are very necessary here at the end of the world, truths that we must understand, Lord, if we are to understand the way you work, for your dealings with men is ever the same. So please, Lord, help us to, 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 to pay close attention to it, uh, Lord, and to bring it home to the hearts, that we may be changed into your image. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. Draw near to us at this hour. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. So, as usual, if you have a question, a comment, anything to say, um, you know, feel free to indicate. And we will take the comment or the question. But, once again... Um, uh, in our earlier videos, we established why we have reform lines. And so now we're just going through these uh, seven um, waymarks in Miller history. Uh, the name is 1842, April 19th, 1844, and the Midnight Cry. So we've established 1798. To October 22nd, and we saw that that was the Seven Thunders, which is a delineation of events that transpires under the first and second angel's message. Why we say the first and second angel's message? The first angel arrived here in 1798, but it was fully preached on August 11, 1840. All right, but right here, the second message arrived, okay, and it was fully preached April 19th, 1844. And the people were tested on that message on October 22nd, 1844. All right. Where the third now begins to be fully preached. All right. So this is what the, the Lord is showing. That's this is why the seventh thunders happens under the first and second angel's message. So before God tests you on a message, he first brings it, establishes it, and then preaches it. And then you're tested on that message. Okay. And the same thing with the second. It, it arrives. It's preached. It's established, uh, it's confirmed, and then you're tested on this message, okay? So the third, it arrived here, April 19th, it is preached, here it is confirmed, and then the people of God were tested on the third angel's message, right? But there are, there are two parts to this message, okay? Um, one in Miller history and one in our history. So for now, we're just looking at Miller history, and we're up now to our third way mark, all right? We saw... That 1798 is where the message arrives. August 11, 18, I mean 1833, parallels where the messenger is raised up. All right, and we had Miller, John, Daniel, Moses, right? All of them being raised up at the same point. Raised up to do what? To preach a message. All right, so it's most likely the next thing we're going to see is them preaching the message. All right, so let us let us now go to our next way mark in Miller history. August 11, 1840. And in GC, uh, GC 3.43, she says, The work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. This is the quote that we're operating from. All right? And this is a great religious movement, 1798 to 1844. And she says, The work of God is ever the same. Then she says, the, the, the principles of God, sorry, dealings with men is ever the same. Then she says, the important movement of the present. So all the important movements, all right, in this history, 
has its parallel, the Bible said, um, Sister White tells us, of those in the past. So this is what we are doing. We're going into the past and finding the parallel for the Millerite history. And we already found two. And then she says, and the experience of the church has great lessons. All right. So the experience that, that, that the church had in former times has lessons for the church in our time. So all their experiences is captured here in Millerite history. So now let us continue. Page 11. We're on page 11 under the heading, August 11, 1840. All right. She says, at the very time specified, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the what? Principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates. All right. One of the first things we see, August 11, 1840, is the great convincing. All right. This is the point where God convinces men of the message of the hour. All right. And this is something we're going to see in all the other waymarks. It is at this point that all men are convinced of what the message is. No, uh, there's no exceptions, right? When you get here, you will be convinced as to who God chose and what message he's given. Convinced, not, not necessarily convicted, but convinced, right? You will be convinced. You, know, you may not accept it, but you will be convinced, all right? And, and to some, some degree, it's conviction, right? What you do with that conviction, though, is, is, is up to you, all right? Well, convicted, because to be convicted is just to be made known the truth, all right? To be shown the truth, all right? What you do with that conviction is totally up to you. So, now let's go to the next one. Oh, I didn't put a head in for that one. All right. So this next quote from Early Writings 259, Paragraph 1. Early Writings 259, Paragraph 1. She says, I was pointed back to the proclamation of the first advent of Christ. John was sent in the power and in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way of whom? Of Jesus. Those who rejected the testimony of John were not benefited by the teachings of whom? Jesus. So, John comes before Jesus. Amen? First John, second Jesus. Amen? So now, go on to the next bold. Early Writings 260, paragraph 1. All right? She says, Those who rejected the what? First message could not be benefited by the second. All right? So she, she, in these two quotes, she likens the message of John and Christ to the first and second angel's message. All right? So here we have the arrival of the first, right? In Christ's line, arrival of the first message, uh, uh, it's, it's typifying it, right? And then John, right? So John was first. And who follows John? Christ. So we should expect to see Christ somewhere in that line, right? So now... Continuing on, Revelation 10 and verse 1, she says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a what? Cloud and a what? Rainbow. A rainbow was upon his head and his face as it were the sun and his feet as pillars of fire. Next quote. The message of Revelation 14, proclaiming the hour, that the hour of God's judgment is come, is given when? In the time of the end, which is... Here, the first angel's message. Amen? We established that. And the angel of Revelation 10 is represented as having what? One foot on the sea and one foot on the land, showing that the message will be carried where? To distant lands. The oceans will be crossed and the islands and the seas will hear the proclamation of the last message of warning to our world. So, it was on August 11, 1840, when this message went to every mission station. All right? 
So, on August 11, 1840, you have a few things. You have the fall of Islam. Well, I, I won't say Islam, right? Let's just say yeah, there's a reason for that. The fall of the Ottoman Empire. All right? But now she also says the, um, that Revelation 10 represents the message going to all the world. Amen? So right here, on August 11, 1840, you have the angel of Revelation 10. Well, how does the Bible describe him? Clothed with a cloud, rainbow upon his head, face as it were the sun, sun and feet as what? Who is this? Jesus. This is Jesus, right? So on August 11, 1840, who comes? Jesus. She says those who rejected John couldn't be benefited by Jesus, Jesus right? So Christ himself came here on August 11, 1840. Amen? All right. So the second angel is Christ. All right? So the first arrived, it's preached, it's confirmed by the arrival of Christ. Amen? John preached and he's confirmed by the arrival of Christ. And we'll, we'll, we'll see that as we go along. So the next quote. 7 BC 971, paragraph 3, she says, The mighty angel who instructed John was what? No less a personage than Jesus Christ, setting his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, shows the part which, who is acting? Who's the he? Christ, amen? He is acting in the closing scenes of the great controversy with Satan. So right here, Christ comes on to show the, him, his work, in the great controversy. Everyone's following? All right. No less a personage than Jesus Christ. This phrase, we'll see it a couple of times. Keep it in mind. No less a personage than Jesus Christ. Um, so, you have the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Um, you have the message going to the worldwide. You have Christ. Right there, no lesser personage than Jesus Christ. And this is what she says about Christ. She says in MS 166, 1898, they what? The teacher was no less a personage than Jesus Christ. So who comes here? The teacher. Right? I want to make this point clear. Christ, the teacher. All right. So already... There's a pattern. First, he sends a man to teach you until the great teacher himself comes and teach you, right? Every time you get to this point on any line, from that moment, Christ should be your teacher. This is what he's teaching, right? From that moment, Christ is the one teaching you, okay? But you must accept the message that came through the man or else Christ can teach you, all right? Those who rejected John could not be benefited by Christ, right? It's impossible to learn anything that Christ teaches if you didn't learn what Christ gave the messenger that came before him, all right? And this is very important. That, that, I mean, this is your salvation. It's very important, all right? So now, let's go up now to the next line. The line of... And we, 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 I'm, on, I'm doing it in this order because um, it's important. All right, so this is the line of Moses, uh, Cyrus, uh, the decrees, Christ, and then Millerites. All right, from this line, we're going to go now to the line of the decrees. Okay? Daniel chapter 10, verses 4 to 7, and verses 11 to 14. The Bible says, And in the four and twentieth day of the month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, then I lifted up mine eyes, and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in what? Linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Euphaz, his body also was like beryl, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like the color up to polished brass, and the words 
the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. So Daniel, right, he, see, he, see, he is in vision. And who does he see coming down? Christ. Amen? All right, so keep that in mind. All right? It says in verse, uh, verse 11. Now this is, um, this is Gabriel speaking to Daniel. It says, And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to do what? To help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. All right. So this 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 one in particular, I do believe you could also line it up with with Miller, right? Because Christ sends Gabriel to Miller, just the same, right? Because the Bible says the Lord sent His angel, all right. And the, the message that Miller received was what was going to happen to the people in the latter days, right? Same thing with um, Daniel here, all right. But this is important because. This leads up to what happens on August 11. Uh, uh, what, this, this particular thing leads up to what happened here, okay, on this next way mark. So, <clears throat> next quote. Truth about angels, 144, paragraph 2. Cyrus the Persian, Monarch, had resisted the impressions of the Spirit of God during the three weeks while Daniel was fasting and praying. But heaven prince, the archangel, was sent to turn the heart of the stubborn king to take some decided action to answer the prayer of Daniel. All right? Let's go to the next quote. So what it says. No less a what? Personage than whom? The Son of God appeared to Daniel. This description is similar to that given by John when Christ was revealed to him upon the Isle of Pathmos. So right here, in answer to Daniel's prayer, Christ, Christ comes down. Everyone follow? Him? All right. Christ, Christ comes down. And um, what, what does he come to make Cyrus do? Come on, what was Cyrus not doing? He was not freeing the Jews. Right? Daniel knew that the time was near, so he was praying. And Christ came to make Cyrus free the Jews. Right? Because Satan was hindering Cyrus from doing his work. And it was prophecy that made Cyrus do his work. Right? Just like it was prophecy that brought the multitudes to be what? Convinced. So now who's convinced? Cyrus is convinced. Right? Right there. Christ comes down. Cyrus is convinced. Christ comes down, multitudes is convinced. And what does Cyrus do? Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. All right, just read the bold part in verse 1. He made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. And, he and, and, and what did he say? Verse 3, just read verse 3. Who there is among you of all his people, his God be with him, let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build a house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So Cyrus issues the first decree. All right. So the first decree, all right, you have Cyrus at the beginning and you have Cyrus here at the first decree. Likewise, Christ comes with the first angel's message. You have Christ here as well. Everyone's following? It's all about Christ, right? The message of deliverance comes, and then deliverance comes. The message of deliverance, Cyrus comes, and then Cyrus delivers. Okay? So all who accepted this message at this point now begin their deliverance 
from captivity, their deliverance from this Babylonian bondage. Whether it's the 1260 or the 70 years of captivity. Are we following? Again, she says, everything in this history finds its parallel in the past. Yes, right? The first, the message that came is now confirmed, right? Cyrus confirmed the work he came for. And notice, it's the fulfillment of prophecy that confirms this work. All right? Yes. So now, so Christ comes, Cyrus issues the decree. Amen? Christ comes, multitudes are convinced. Same thing. Okay? And then the first angel message goes forth. All right? It's a, it's, 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 it's a decree. The first angel message is a decree. It says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is... And the first set of people who feared God came out, right? Miller and his associates, right? And the multitude. So now we're going to look at Christ's line. Come back down to Christ's line. Obviously, who comes here? Right. Yeah, because the pattern is the same. If Christ comes here, Christ comes here, Christ got to come there. Amen? All right. So now let's go now to um, Bible Echo, March 8th. 1897, paragraph 4. She says, When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Man's terrible necessity demanded help without delay. Who met this necessity? An illustrious what? Who came here? No, what she says, no lesser person Christ is the teacher. Right? So here, who comes? An illustrious teacher. What did Christ come here to do? To teach Daniel. What shall befall thy people in the latter days? A teacher came here. All right? A teacher came here. So we see what here? A teacher. Okay? So. Right here. No less a personage than Jesus Christ came down to teach. Amen? So it says, she says, an illustrious teacher, the son of God, the eternal word came to our world to win the confidence of Humanity, the prophet that had been revealed to Moses, like unto his brethren, whom they should hear in all things, came as man's what? So he came, right? And he came, and he came. Is it all the same? Right? Christ comes in different ways, right? So everybody, when they see Christ coming, they think it's the second coming, but Christ can come. All right, that's what he does. He comes in different ways. Amen. So it says, Hear, O heavens, and be astonished, O earth, for the appointed what? Instructor of man was no less a personage than the Son of God. All of, when you get to this point on all of our lines, if Christ is not instructing you, you're, not, you, 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 you're behind. Right? From this point on, they were to go forward with Cyrus's instructions. Here, it was Daniel, right? Cyrus listened to Daniel. Darius listened to Daniel, right? It, Daniel was the man sent to convince Cyrus. Once Cyrus was convinced, Cyrus is my shepherd, who is Christ, from that moment on, they were to listen to Cyrus. That's it. Cyrus was now the voice. He said, go and build the house, right? Christ came from that moment on. Who were they supposed to listen to? Christ. John chapter 1, right? The disciples left John and went to Christ, right? We have found the Messiah. Millerite history is the same thing. From that moment on, Christ was teaching them. And we'll see that as we continue. So, when you get to this point, if you're not getting your instructions from the Bible, you're not getting it from nowhere. It's, it, yeah, it has to be coming from Satan, right? So now, Deuteronomy 18.15 is, is where Moses says the, um, the Lord will raise up a prophet like me. All right, so we, we could skip that. Um, the next quote, 21 MR, I just read the bold part. It says, why is it that at the beginning of his public ministry, Christ was led into the wilderness to be tempted? So it was at the beginning of his ministry, he was led into the wilderness. Amen. Let's go to the next quote. The steps in conversion. Plainly marked out are repentance, faith in Christ as the world's redeemer, faith in his death, burial, and resurrection, shown by what? Baptism. 
and his ascension on high to plead in the sinner's behalf. At the very commencement of his public ministry, he presented himself in the, in the character he sustained to man throughout his meditorial work. He identifies himself with sinners as their substitute, taking upon himself their sins, numbering himself with the transgressors, and doing the work the sinner is required to do in repentance, faith, and willing obedience. What an example is there is here given in the life of Christ for sinners to intimate. If they will not follow the example, imitate, amen. If they will not follow the example given them, they will be without what? Without excuse. What was his example at the beginning of his ministry? Baptism, right? So this is what we mark here, his baptism, right? This is where Christ now comes to confirm whose message? John's message. What was John's message? There is one coming whose shoes I am not worthy to loose, right? And, and when, when he came, what did John say? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the... Christ confirmed John's message by making his appearance. Confirms Daniel's message by Cyrus freeing the people. Confirms Miller's message by the fall of the Ottoman Empire. All right? All right. So from that moment on, you should be listening to Christ. So now let's go to Matthew chapter 3. It says in verse 13, 13 to 17, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be what? Baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou unto me? So John knew that Christ was the one to take away his sin, right? He says, well, what are you doing? Why are you baptizing me? I should be baptizing you. This is really important. Right? Because it teaches us about this way, Mark. Something happens here. Right? Christ does something here. He subjects himself to something. Right? Just for a little time. It's important. Right? Because he has to establish himself and his work. Okay? And he will do something that is outside of our, our understanding. Right? Outside of what we think should happen. John, John knew he, Christ was supposed to baptize him. He, he absolutely knew. All right. So let's continue. Verse 14. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it be so for now, for thus it become us to do what? Fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. So there's something Christ fulfills in each one that must happen. We just have to live with what he does there. Right? Because it's fulfilling righteousness. All right. And one of the things I could think about in our time is a lot of men like to look at Jeff and say, look at him, what kind of person he is. But Christ said, suffer it be so for now. Right. Because it behooves me to fulfill righteousness through him in whatever condition you see him. All right. It's really important that we understand this particular thing. Otherwise, we're going to miss Christ's work in our time and we're going to confuse it for the work of men. So why did Christ say um, it becometh us to fulfill our righteousness. Christ understood his mission. Matthew chapter 5. Let's read Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. It says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to what? Okay, so had Christ baptized John, he would have been destroying the law. Right? Because the law states, in order for a sinner to be saved, that's what we read in the quote, you know, the, what you demonstrate your, con, your, your, your repentance by baptism. So if Christ didn't do that, he would have been skipping the steps. He couldn't show us a perfect life if he didn't get baptized. So he said, John, I got to fulfill this because I came to fulfill all the law. Right? Not part of the law, but all the law. Right? So John says, okay, John obedient. Right? He says, all right, we'll do it that way. So... The Bible says, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till what? Not, not uh, till all be fulfilled. Everything must be fulfilled. That's why he got baptized. All right? To show them that he was fulfilling the law. Amen? Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 21. And you'll see that heaven agrees. 
It says the Lord is well pleased for what? For his righteousness sake. He will what? Magnify the law and make it honorable. How? By fulfilling it. That's how he was magnifying the law of Moses. Right? By fulfilling it. By going in the water, he was magnifying the law. Right? And the Bible says the Lord, right? Uppercase Lord. I didn't do that. Right? That's important. Right? That this is the Father now. The Lord is well pleased for his what? Righteousness sake. What did he say, John? Suffer it be so for now, for it behooves us to fulfill all what? So the Father was pleased. How can we prove that the Father was pleased, Emily? Yes. Let's read verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, straight up, went up, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were open upon him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a... So another thing comes down here. The Spirit of God. Amen? And lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am what? Well pleased. All right? So right here, Christ does what he does, and the Father says, I am well pleased, which means right here in the Millerites, what did he say to them? I am well pleased, right? Because the, 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 the very rules that was given to Miller, they used it to, to predict the prophecy. And God was pleased because they used the rules, right? Cyrus, God was well pleased because Cyrus was moved upon and Cyrus... Um, he was so well pleased that Cyrus gave them from his house. Right? What did he do? He emptied out the treasure of his storehouse. What, what, what is Christ? Christ is the treasure of the storehouse of heaven. Right? God went well pleased that he emptied out the storehouse. The Holy Spirit came down. Right? Cyrus emptied his storehouse. Amen? In this time, God emptied his storehouse. We'll see. He emptied his storehouse of truth because Christ came down in his hand. And seven thunders uttered their voices. All right? So, the last line, we'll go up now to Moses' line. Moses' line is pretty easy because Moses is a type of Christ. All right? So, everything Christ does, we kind of see, see it in Moses. All right? So, now let's go to Moses' line. Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 to 26. It says, And it came to pass... By the way of the inn, that the what? The Lord met him and sought to do what? How did the Lord meet him? The angel had to come down. Right? When you read Ellen White, she'll tell you this was Christ. This was not, um, this was not an angel. Uh, this was Christ. All right? So it says, Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son, and cast it at his feet, and said, Surely a bloody husband thou art to me. So he let him go. Then said he, A bloody husband thou art, because of the circumcision. All right? Now, so what is circumcision? We're moving out the foreskin, okay? All right. Yes, separation from the world is a little more. I want to add to that. Circumcision, yes, is also the removing of sin, right? But because what did Christ come to do? Take away the sin of the world, right? So what did he come to do here? <laughs> Take away the sin of the world, right? Moses, because of his, I, and I do believe, I don't, I don't think I have to prove that. But Moses, he, had, he still had Egyptian in him. He had a world. He had the world in him. Right? His wife is the one that stopped him from doing that. Right? He didn't learn that in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, it says the wife shall be subject to the husband. In Egypt, on the other hand, wives do what they want. And Moses still had a little Egypt in him. Right? That's what he's showing. And so what did Christ come to do? Take away the sin of the world from him. All right? So let's continue. But Moses did not circumcise his child. Why was Moses supposed to circumcise the child? Let's go to Genesis 18. Genesis 18, verses 17 to 19. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great 
and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, he will what? Command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath what? Ah, okay. uh, like this. Ah, uh, like this last line. Okay. What did, what did the Lord spoke about Abraham? He says, In thee shall all the earth be blessed. Right? Genesis chapter 15. Right? When God made the covenant with Abraham. What was the last thing he told him? Thy people shall be a what? Stranger. Right? In a, in a land, right? And they shall serve that land. But he says what? In the fourth generation, they shall come. I'll bring them thither, right? That was the promise to Abraham. What was Moses on the way to fulfill? The promise to Abraham. He was on his way to bring them out. That was the promise, right? Okay. So Moses was acting as Abraham. Abraham wasn't there. But Moses was acting in Abraham's stead. Everyone's following? All right. Obviously, Moses is, is Abraham is his father. All right? So now, Abraham will command his what? Did Moses command his? No. No. The Lord couldn't fulfill that promise until Moses commanded his household. That's why the Lord came. That's one of the reasons the angel came down to kill him. It was Abraham commanded. That's what, that's what we just read. It says, Abraham, I know him. He will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord. This part, to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. In order for the Lord to bring about that freedom to Abraham's seed, the seed had to do what the Lord told Abraham to do because they were his household, right? And so Moses was, was not a part of Abraham's household at this time, right? He, so the angel came down to, to... Now, keep in mind that God, has, God is merciful, right? God is merciful. Even though Moses didn't do it, the Lord had mercy on him. All right? But we can't willfully do that. All right? Moses just let his wife get in his ears. All right? Oh, don't touch your boy. You're going to hurt and all that stuff. You know how the wives get on. All right? And at the end of the day, who did it? She did. All right? What, just what she was trying to avoid, she herself had to do. You know why? She also had to overcome. All right? So both her and Moses had to overcome. Are we following? Now, I know he didn't say Moses repent in, the, in there, but Moses repented, right? Because Christ repented. Christ was baptized for us, right? So Moses definitely repented, all right? Otherwise, he couldn't go forward. A Amen. So listen to this, Isaiah 55, 52, sorry, and verse 11. It says, Depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence, touch no what? Unclean thing, Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean, ye that bear the what? Moses was bearing the Lord's message to Pharaoh. All right? And the command is, be ye clean, ye that bear the vessel of the Lord. So wait a minute. You say Miller was clean? Yes, he was. Cyrus? Yes, he was. He had a work to do at that time. He, was, he did a righteous act. Amen? Christ, obviously. Right? No, Moses. Right? Moses had to be clean. Right? So, let us continue. You will like this one. First Testimony. I like this one. First, Test First Timothy 3, 2-5. to five. The Bible says, A bishop then must be what? Blameless. Moses couldn't do that part unless he was blameless. All right? The husband of one wife. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no, not, no striker, not greedy or filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own what? House. Every minister must be of the house of Abraham. 
right? Because that's it. Abraham commands his household, all right? It says, having his children in what? Subjection with all gravity. For if a man know how to rule his own, know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the what? What was Moses going to take care of? The whole of Israel. And if as long as he didn't know how to command his household, couldn't take part in this work. Amen? Miller also had to learn back here. All right? Christ obviously knows how to take care of his household. Amen? All right. But how did Christ learn to take care of his household? In the flesh. No, in the flesh. You're looking at his divinity. I'm not talking about Christ came here as a human. He was baptized as a human. So how did he know how to take care of his household? Of his household? Yeah, he became you and I. By becoming you, he grew up and experienced the things of the household. So he knows exactly how to take care of the household. Right? Because that's what it says in Hebrews, right? Because he was touching all our infirmities, now he's able to succor. He's able to take care of us. Amen? All right. Moses learned with the sheep when he was in the wilderness. Amen? He learned to take care of the household. So, now let us read um, Patriarchs and Prophets 256, paragraph 1. This is what Sister White says. In his mission to Pharaoh, Moses had be, was to be placed in a position of great peril. His life could be preserved only through the protection of holy angels. But while living in neglect of a known duty, he would not be secure, for he could not be shielded by the angels of God. In the time of trouble, just before the coming of Christ, the righteous will be preserved through the ministration of heavenly angels. But there will be no security for the transgressor of God's law. Angels cannot then protect those who are disregarding one of the divine precepts. Now, I thought I put that text in here, but it didn't seem... I did, I did put it. I didn't read it. Uh, I didn't read it. Genesis 17 and verse 10. Right? This is the covenant he made with Abraham. Genesis 17 and verse 10. It says, This is my covenant which he shall keep between me and you and I seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be what? Circumcised. That's the covenant God made with Abraham. Right? So when Moses was going in, he was not in line with the covenant. Right? And so because of that, the angel came down to, to deal with him. Now, at the Sunday law, this is going to be terrible. Because God is going to kill you. That's it. If you're not in line with the covenant, he's going to kill you. If you're not under the first, second, and third angel's message. Right? Because that's the covenant. Revelation 18. When he comes down there, he is going to kill you. All right? And, and this is very serious. This is why we must understand these. Right? So he comes... Melorite history shows the fulfillment of prophecy. Christ's history shows the lamb that takes away your sins at the time of the fulfillment of prophecy. Right? This history teaches you what heaven is doing. This is what Cyrus, that's what it's teaching you. Heaven is making a decree on your behalf. Because of heaven's decree, you can be pardoned. So at the Sunday law, this is what it's teaching you. And right here, it teaches you that we got to go in with Christ. Okay, we have to go along with him. And all these women are to teach us how to act in it because she says they possess lessons for our time. All right. So Moses here was, the, was, was, was going into Egypt and God comes down to confirm that it was him by, 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 by with the threatening motion. And right there, Moses remembers and he repents. He puts away that sin. And at the same time, the last text says that, and the Lord said to Abraham, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 27, and the Lord said to Aaron, sorry, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and what? Met him. Verse 28. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had command, commanded him. So it was Miller and his associates, right? It was Christ and the disciples. Because when he was baptized, he took unto himself disciples, right? It was Cyrus, along with Daniel and the children of Israel, uh, right? 
and here it's Moses and Aaron. Okay? As soon as the minister is never sent by himself, so praise God. Right? Christ ne he never sends him by himself. So, this, this, this to me is very easy to see. It's always Christ arriving at this way, Mark. All right? And, and, and he's coming to confirm the message. Right? He's coming to confirm it. But he's coming to also show from that moment, if you don't have him, you're as good as dead. Right? That's it. If you don't have Christ, if Christ is not the one leading you and teaching you from that point on, you are as good as dead. That's what, that's what this line is teaching. You might, as well, you might as well let him kill you in that time. All right? Because everything angels cannot are not um, commissioned to take care of you if you have one known sin. That's the key. One known sin. All right? There are things we do that we don't know yet. All right? When you come to this line, Miller was not a perfect man. But he lived up to everything that he knew. All right? He didn't have any known sins. This is what he's teaching you. All right? Christ, well, there is no known sin there. All right? Cyrus teaches you what heaven is going to do. All right? And Moses, he repented of that one known sin when he was made, uh, uh, when he was given to him. She's also teaching us that this way, Mark, is where your sins are made known to you. Because it's a call to what, Sister M? Repentance. Right? Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. This history, August 11, 1840, was designed to take away the sin of the world. And you know what the sin of the world was in this time? One of the sins of the world? A misunderstanding of prophecy. August 11, 1840 was designed to take away that sin from them. All right? And, one, and those who accepted it went forward, and we will see in the next way, Mark, they had great power here in the 1843 chart. Okay? So, go ahead. Yes? Known. Wasn't. What happened in the 1260? What was the papacy enforcing during the 1260? Sunday worship. Every Protestant came out of the 1260 thinking Sunday was a Sabbath. They didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing to them. There was no Sabbath in their minds. Yeah, and even then, yeah, well, none of them, actually. Right? They didn't get the Sab Sabbath until, like, Ellen White didn't start keeping the Sabbath until, like, 1846, 1848. Right? So, they, 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 um... The, the, the ideas of the papacy was still the ideas of the papacy was still in their minds in this time. Okay? So um yeah, this 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 is this is um this yeah, they still had the ideas. I mean it's the same thing with, with Moses, right? It's not that Moses was perfect, but like he didn't know that he walked in the, he walked in the light that he had. Yeah, yeah. right. Right. And, 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 and here, Moses could have just simply forgotten. Right? Oh, he allowed his wife to talk him out of it in, 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 in maybe in the, in the hope that he's making peace in his house. Right? But he's not really making peace. He's only bringing the wrath of God. Right? That's what, that's what he teaches us. To make peace with, with, with the wives over things that God said to do? Ah, not good. It's right there. Better be better mad with the wife than then have God mad at you, right? Better you mad with your husband than have God mad at you, okay? That you don't want it because when God comes down, she says, the angel comes down in a threatening manner as if to kill him, all right? And all because he didn't obey that one precept. And that's what he's teaching us. At the Sunday law, if you have one spot, one spot, mark of the beast. That's what he's teaching you. It only takes one spot. So, we, we are in a time where we really need to be praying earnestly and honestly about God taking away things from us, right? And he's really trying to take us out of this world. He's reviewing these things, but he's adding light to it. And that, that's what I like about it. As, as I go over it, he's just adding light to it. Certain, certain things you hear me say, is like, I'm just hearing it for the first time myself. And I was like, ah, praise God. He's just adding light to these things. 
And um, by God's grace, when we, we can all understand this because, again, she says they have lessons, right? The experience they had is lessons for us, just like I drew out from here, all right? Obey, obey God and not your wife. You could draw that lesson from there, right? So if you, if you obey your wife over God, then God's wrath is upon you. That's as simple as that. So many lessons we can learn from, from these things, okay? We could see and deduce that Miller had no known sin, or is God not using him? That's what the Bible is teaching us, all right? Cyrus, what did he know about God? He was a heathen. So in the eyes of God, he had no known sin, right? Because he was a heathen. But his mind was pure enough that God could give him some truth and turn him to do his work, right? Now, is Cyrus saved? I don't know. But still, the Lord is showing us what he can do with a pure heart, right? So, I mean, just go through it. Nice lessons. You could do whole sermons for hours just going through each way mark and just taking the little thoughts. So, I pray that this evening was clear and I encourage going over it. You're not going to get everything just sitting and listening to it. Um, when these videos come up, uh, we are doing one every Friday. Um, tonight's own um, already uh, went, 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 went through. And um, um, there will be enough videos for you guys to watch at while I'm gone. Until I return. Shall we close and pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for these truths that you are giving us and for explaining it to us, Lord. We know that when truths are explained to us in such a clear manner, Lord, we are certain that the Holy Spirit has been with us. And we thank you for the Spirit that has been among us this evening. We pray and ask, O oh Lord, that you please help us not to grieve the Spirit, Lord, not to send him away, but to re receive the Spirit into our hearts, Lord, and have him live within us, that we may become like Christ. Please be with us as we go through the rest of this Sabbath day. Help us, Lord, to keep it holy, not by might, not by power, but by thy Spirit. We surrender ourselves and ask that you'll be with us throughout the rest of this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I saw another angel fly in the mist of heaven. Having the everlasting gospel to preach Unto them that dwell on the earth And to every nation And kindred and tongue and people Sing with
Revelation 14, 6 and 7.